Hi, welcome to the Secret Art of Business. And my guest today is Julie DeLuca Collins. And her business is Go Confidently Services. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's correct. one of the divisions of that is Go Confidently Coaching. And I am super excited to have you today because we're going to talk about, you know, how you are working your left and right brain to get get you propelled into um, this and what well, got you propelled into this and how you're going to keep going forward with it. But um, one of the things that I liked is that you started out teaching. So yay, yay for teachers and things like <laughs> <Yes>. that. <laughs> so let's, let's start with you talking about um, your business and what it is you do there. Yeah. Thank you again for having me. I've been looking forward to our conversation because I think that this is so relevant to a lot of us here in this in, in the industry of the online world. I am a coach. I'm a business and life strategy coach. So I help individuals build and become the confident CEO of their life and business because there is an intersection between what we do to earn a living, but also who we are. And I want people to know that sometimes people try to separate it but mm -hmm. you you your brand your individuality and your purpose are really driving you forward so it's important to really know that there's no silos when it comes to life yeah and i think um the one of the some of the buzzwords we hear around that are um imposter syndrome mm. and things like that and and that's the sort of stuff that you're like oh no we have to we have to get rid of that because why yeah, not absolutely you know? And it's normal. It's normal oh, yes, because it our is. brain it. is programmed to do that. Our brain has the, the negativity bias that is always going to point out the ways in which we don't measure up. It's going to mm -hmm. point out the ways in which we are not maybe making the cut or is going to say, oh, you better please everybody else before, you know, otherwise you're not going to be accepted. Yes. But the reality is that being aware of that and knowing that that's part of the process and then learning how to um, create a, a less heavy backpack because the imposter syndrome and all these sabotaging thoughts and behaviors are like these little rocks that we carry in our life's backpack. And we need to kind of unpack those and leave them on the road. And sometimes, you know, maybe we leave the ro the, the rock, but we pick up a smaller one, but it's not <laughs> as burdensome as before. Yeah. Maybe just a little pebble in our shoe versus the big <laughs> rocks. In the right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this, this sort of stuff is just so important because I, wa I always want people to know that not, not only they're not alone in this, but we all struggle with it. So just kind of accept it and just figure out how you can kind of get past it. Um, because yeah, to exactly to your point, and this is my big thing is it's about pleasing others. You know, when you mm. are in a situation maybe where like, in my case, nobody in my family owns a business or, you know, has d done a lot of things that I've done, gone to college and things like that. You know, it's hard to sometimes go to that family get together and, mm -hmm. you know, try and speak confidently, but not feel like you're, you know, yeah all that. <laughs> For yeah, it's, it's, it's a dance, right? We have to kind of it's navigate the circumstances. And, and really, I think that this is where people um, really feel the overwhelm when they allow people's opinions and expectations to really be what define them. But the more, and actually, I think I, today, yes, it seems like a long time ago, but today I did an Instagram story about this. Um, the definition that somebody else has for you cannot be what weighs you down. You have yes. to really be able to learn to love and accept yourself. And by the way, we don't ever get to 100% acceptance, 100% love. This is the work that we do on a daily basis and we choose to do it. But the more that we listen to our voice, the more that we say, hey, you're good, Julie good job or, or accepting uh, the things that we're doing and say, you know what, I know that people would like rather this than that. Um, and be okay with that. Like I, I started coaching um, even when I was still in corporate America, I had clients, but I never really talked about it on social media. Didn't really mm -hmm, talk to mm -hmm. people about it because I had, I was an executive in corporate America. I had this really great job, the title I'd reached, you know, the mm -hmm. level that most people want to at one point if they're in that track. And it, it would seem like, Oh, what are people going to think of me? And that was one of the things right. that really helped me back. I, I think that's so spot on. And we could honestly talk about this for an hour in itself, but you, yeah. um, like you said, you mentioned you do blog about this and I will put all that information in this um, podcast and in when I post it. So people are able to find yeah. you and connect if they need more information. 
um, or help for that matter. <laughs> um, but let's let's get to our conversation. And yeah. I want to know, you know, I, I love, like I said, I love your journey. But at some point, you were not that executive and you were not a coach. You were a kid. And uh -huh. what did you do as a kid that really sparked your creativity or innovation? Oh my goodness. I love this question so much. I actually did a meditation earlier yesterday oh my about, um, in, it, it was beautiful. And it actually, you know what? It was a meditation that someone did on the Oprah show in 1990 something. And someone posted <laughs> this meditation online and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to do this meditation. And it really was about picturing. And I, it took me back to that child. And so it's very vivid in my mind right now. I was fortunate enough. Uh, my mom is from El Salvador and I was born there. My dad is from the, the States, but we were living there when I was a young girl. And my grandmother, we lived at my grandmother's house and her house was magical. Her house was really uh, this magical place. My grandmother was a, a, a principal. She had her own school. So although there was a school in the other side, um, we lived in this big house with hallways and there was a stage and I got to play in the school as a child to pretend nice. to be a teacher. But also the other thing that I love to do is um, my grandmother was a pianist in her own right, very w well known in, in the country. Um, and I started taking lessons, but we also had, um, I would take dance and we had a place where the recitals for the school would happen. And I would go in and I would, it was this big open, um, hall, like a, like a, I, I don't want to call it a ballroom because it wasn't a ballroom, but it was a big expanse room where they would set up the chairs for the recitals. And I would go in and I would choreograph <laughs> dance productions for myself and my sisters and my cousins because they live nearby as well. And we had this wonderful childhood in which I, um, and, and we used to play, we used to play uh, royalty and I never wanted to be the princess. I never wanted to be the queen. I was the prime minister because the oh, prime minister had it. all the power. The prime minister is the one that decided, <laughs> you know, what would take place. But I was also the director, choreographer, never the star, but just, and, and I would coach my siblings oh this is how you want to do this or this you're you're gonna wear this outfit for the show it's gonna look terrific and by the way you're doing so great um so there was a lot of um ability for me to use my imagination and be creative and by the way uh when i and at somewhere along the line i started to tell myself a story that i was not creative because I couldn't paint and I couldn't, mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't draw like some of my siblings and cousins could do. But the other stuff that I did was so creative. It enabled me to right. just dream up these productions. And during the holidays, we would have these elaborate productions with costume changes and music. And um, it, it really was such a beautiful experience for me that um, started to foster in me the ability to know that I can take something from just a thought to, as the music was resonating, I would think, oh, that would be really neat if the guys can come in at this point and the girls would do twirl this way. And and I love that. I really, really love that. Well, and you have I, just painted an absolutely lovely picture of your childhood. I mean, really. Um, and not a far stretch from where you are today, but I am going to ask, you know, how did you get from there to here? What was a little bit of your thinking in yeah. your career path? You know, so I, it, because I grew up in a family of educators, it became a very natural progression that I would become an educator. And I went to school to become a teacher, started working uh, as a pre-kindergarten preschool teacher, and then I moved to work with middle school. And I enjoyed that time. I enjoyed working with my students and growing in um, it really was in my blood to teach. It was really in my blood to guide somebody, to praise them, to encourage them, to help them discover. Yet there was something that was missing. And, um, it, and really, uh, by the way, shout out to teachers because it is a super important creative job. You have mm -hmm. to think in your feed. You have to sort of go with the flow. You have to plan yeah. in advance. But at the same time, it was exhausting. It was exhausting. And for me, I decided, you know what, I need to make some money because at the time, not only was I working, but I also had a second job to supplement my income. 
And right. it really was just exhausting. Yeah. So then I decided, and that's you know what? And that's unfortunate. And I decided to leave teaching. And I was recruited by this point. I um, We weren't living in El Salvador. We, we came because of the war. We came to Miami. And that's where I went to high school. And then um, my dad's family was in New York. I went to school in D.C. But then I moved to New York. And um, I was recruited by an educational company that took my background, took my background in uh, retail sales. <laughs> It mm -hmm. took my background in education, and they offered me a position to work as center director for an educational company. And the center director, I got to train and hire teachers, work with parents, and provide tutoring programs to the kids. And that's where the beginning of my career started, in which I was able to sort of um, this this appeal to the other part of me, the entrepreneurial part of me that um, loves to explore and grow and really um, create and build something out of the need that someone has and to be able to help them in that manner. So I, I worked with this company, and when I first started, um, they assigned me one of the corporate centers for tutoring that was probably the lowest performing in, in the system of over 300 centers, three 400 centers. And the competitive side of me did not like that <laughs> and felt like... Well, somebody is at the top of this, and we went to a, yeah, yeah. we went to a national conference for all the employees of the company, and they did awards for the low, highest performing centers. And I remember thinking, "Ooh, you can get that! Like, oh, this is so nice." And um, I was in the elevator with uh, one of the founders of the company. And being being oh, wow. that outspoken, confident person, I said, uh, you know, hi, you don't know me. You don't know me. I just started working here three months ago, but I love what you do. You know, I, I worked, I, I grew up in a family of educators and I feel it's so important to be able to help families and students that struggle with school. But I have a question for you. How do I get on that stage next year? How do I make my center that is struggling now become one of the highest performers so that I can impact the lives of more people? And she looked at me and she said, relationships. Go and make relationships with teachers, mm -hmm. principals, mm -hmm. and um, you will see that things turn around. And she was 100% right. By the oh, time um, the next year was... Uh, was uh, come came about. I had grown to be one of the top three performing centers in the whole system. Oh my goodness! But really, yeah. because I had I had a mission to be able to impact the lives of the families that were coming. Because when a child struggles in school, and the parents don't know how to help, and they're trying to, and they're sitting mm -hmm. in that dining room table trying to help with homework, right? And we saw this through the pandemic. It's it's frustrating. And we were cre we were providing a service, right? And this is going back almost twenty years now that you know this happened. But it really was a need. But I also got to meet the other people who I was partnering with because if a teacher has a student that's struggling in school, and by the way, as a teacher, I knew how difficult it is if you're trying to get through a lesson plan and you have the kids that are really high performers and you have the students that are struggling and you're kind of like teaching somewhere in the middle. Um, it is really frustrating. So knowing that I could support the teachers as well and say, hey, if you know anybody struggling, we this is how we help kids. So it created that relationship. And within, I would say the next year, I was promoted to come into the corporate office to do training, to help others. Uh, but sort of my path, this is where things kind of aligned for me. Mm -hmm. I I'm was super excited to, awesome. I was <laughs> super excited to go into training and that I was going to train people and help them. And again, mm -hmm. teaching, um, but at the same time, something happened that I didn't expect, but there was the law, no, the no child left behind law that was passed. Oh yes. And, um, one of the things that the company wanted to do was to apply to become and, and, and complete some of the grants that several different states were releasing so that companies like this one could uh, contract with school districts and be paid not by the parents but by the school district for providing the tutoring services for students. Uh, my dad worked for um, an agency that used to do a lot of grant writing. So I had experience in grant writing. 
So all of that experience that I had gotten oh in, in, through college, working and helping my dad and volunteering and, and, and interning with his company allowed me to gain a skill that when I was at the right place at the right time, and this company that had just promoted me to training said, hey, um, you know how to do grant writing. Can you help us? Rather than the company hiring a grant writer, right, I right. jumped right in. So I started to then create my own path because, again, I knew retail because I needed to be able to supplement my income. So I know sales. I know relationship right, right. building. I also understood the the complexity of the, our program as a center director. I understood the curriculum. So I could then write about it and help to start to apply to the different grants. In the first year, I worked with the VP of business development, and he became a mentor. And by the end of the year, we had 12 different contracts with school districts that we were working oh, with. And he really helped to teach me how to review contracts, how to, you know, what I needed to look at. I worked with the company's lawyers. I was writing the grants. And then all of a sudden, we started to grow this tiny little department. And every time I learned a new skill... I really uh, was able to move to the next step in my career and then the next step. And this yeah. is how I started to climb the corporate ladder. I really love that you explained how you have to sometimes get a little scrappy when it comes to getting to that next job too and uh, digging into your past of the experience you have. Because I, I too was, I waited tables as one of my first jobs and bus tables and things like that. Mm -hmm. And people automatically will discount that. It's like, you don't know, that is like Ooh. ground zero for customer service, as is 100%. retail. 100%. Um, 100%. And, and it's like, it, you know, kind of work that into a conversation and an interview, you know, that's that you, you know, mm -hmm. you handled it, the hard stuff. And you were talking about the grant writing and some, you know, just something kind of came up like, oh, wait a second, I do know how to write grants. And that helped you get to the next your next step, mm -hmm. which may not have happened if you had not spoken up and you just kind of brought this yeah. up. I mean, my, in my company, I do staffing and I always ask people, have you ever done project management? Even not as a, even as a title, but you know, whatever, because we want to talk about that because that's needed for this role, but people don't automatically think about some of those kind of, you know, tasks they did that are off to the side that they, yeah. they did, but they don't give themselves credit for. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. And like I said, the, your path just seemed, I mean, just so yeah. fluid. <laughs> it's like, you know, from, from the director of the, the, the school, the, at the school with the kids and your family and stuff like that to mm -hmm. you know, directing to where people should be going now and helping and being competitive and innovative. I mean, it's everything that, you know, I like talking about on this podcast. So yeah, you woven yeah. that in perfectly, which leads me to my, my next question. And that is how are you still being creative today and innovative, any of that? Love it. Um, you know, my, my last title in corporate America was chief innovation officer. And one of the reasons that that was the title that I held is because innovation comes very naturally to me. Innovation, thinking outside the box and just kind of uh, looking at a bigger picture and figuring out, okay, this is kind of how the puzzle pieces fit. Um, in my job and in, in what I do now, one is a business owner. I do have to innovate. I do have to I don't have um, the marketing the uh, budget that maybe a Fortune 500 company has, but I still need to innovate ways in which mm -hmm. I can put myself out there. I have to innovate ways in which I can create a amazing but incredible high touch customer or service experience for my clients. I I cannot, you know, send them a basket that's thousands of dollars or five hundred dollars, but I can mm -hmm. send them a thank you note. I can send yes. them um maybe I there's an app that I love. It's called Thanks a uh, Thanks without the A. And you can send little uh coffee breaks for people and, you know, and, and, and innovation comes in different shapes and sizes. Absolutely. What happens to many of us is that we judge our effort on somebody else's results. Mm. So when we are seeing somebody else's results, oh, look at what they're sending, look at what they're doing, look at the innovation. And then we start to stack up our efforts next to theirs. Right. 
where we, we start to feel that imposter syndrome. We start to feel like we don't measure yeah. up and this is what drags us down. Yeah, but today I innovate in so many ways um, from thinking, okay. Uh, so for instance, I wanted to grow the marketing and, and, and what we were doing for our business. And yes, I have someone that we hired, but we needed more help. So the first thing that I, that I asked, and this is how our brain works. And this is what I would love your listeners to find that if you ask the right question, your brain works like a computer and it will give you the right answer. So yes. I said, not, Oh, I can't do this. I can't market. I don't have the money. That's where most people stay and they're stuck. But if you say, well, how can I, what can I do? How can right, I do right. this? Immediately I start, I, one of the first things I did is like, you know what? There are a lot of kids here in Connecticut that are in college that are working to get a marketing degree and I started to reach out to these schools and to the professors and then I got some interns that are looking for experience and are looking for someone to help them monitor and, and mentor them and I've been a mentor in the past in colleges and help other students as they go through their career so mm -hmm, why not mm -hmm. have them for the exchange of the experience and now they have um, experience they have a recommendation and I get some help with, right. with my business, my clients right. get some help. So it's definitely the innovations that I've been able to create for my business. Very cool. Um, but do you still do anything um, like, are you still directing plays? Are you, are you, you said you weren't <laughs> a painter, but are you doing something that is just like a really tactile creative thing that's just for you that's not about the business because i love that you mentioned you know how you say innovative with your business because and actually let me go back a little bit rewind that a little bit and just in that i love how you kind of basically explain much sim much simpler than i'm going to hear is i that how you your right side has this great idea and it sends it over to the left side to kind of figure out how to do it and we have to be aware that sometimes this left side says no nah, it's not going to work you got to keep going yeah. back and forth and just say no i really do i feel passionate about this you you really yeah. figure this out yeah you know um, and, and that's and, how the and I want to I want to address that before I answer your question because okay, no, I think this is the, this is the other thing <laughs> this is the other thing that we get stuck at um, one of the things that and and I really have become I am a tiny habit certified coach, certified coach and one of the things that I know is that creating tiny habits and, and routines for ourselves and our business is something that really helps us um, the one thing that I've set up is that um, I have days in my business in which there are creative days. I have days in my business in which they're more the other type of days where you look yeah. at the finances, you look at, and yes. because when yes. we are switch tasking, then it's difficult for our brain to go from, no, oh, that's very creative to, so what I'll do oh, is if that. I have an idea that's creative, then it needs to get into the execution part, then that's not something that I jump in on that day. Or, or, or if I do, it's after, you know, I, I maybe have lunch or do something and then I move to, to that task because that allows my brain to, you know, not have the negative Nelly that's saying, oh, you can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. I just, it's a great idea. No, it's not. And then you go back and forth <laughs> right. and you exhaust yourself. You exhaust you yourself. Right. You can, but it's, so, it's good conversation um, sometimes too. So <laughs> it, it, it's a great it's a great time to if if you're able to understand that sometimes you're going to have that negative Nelly in your brain. Yeah, yeah. And just bring awareness, and oh, you know how to, to manage safe. that awareness. I mean, I, it's not necessarily always negative. Um, it is there yeah. to keep us safe and to really think about things. Um, but yeah. don't let it, you know, rule. You know, it doesn't get the last Absolutely. say. Absolutely. We all have that inner judge. We all have the inner judge and we have a whole cast of characters that try yep. to sabotage us, but not because they have bad intentions, but because yep. one, we created the sabotaging behaviors to protect us as children. We yes. created all of these things to help us um, and keep us safe because that's what we're looking for. Well, um, I find out that that my right side would just go off, off on every tangent, every wild hair yes. that I have without it being kind of vetted with the left side. Yeah. So, that was serious. Think, think about this. You yeah, know? you know, I keep I keep a list. And actually, I um, before before you and I jumped on the call, I was doing a coaching call. And one of the things that I do and I share this with my clients is I keep a list of all of the things that I'm working on as far as my monthly goals, right? However, I have a sheet within the spreadsheet that um, it's called the brainstorm. And if I have an idea that comes up, I don't dismiss it. I don't go chase it, but I 
table it. I put it on mm-hmm, there. Mm-hmm. So when I have time, I'm like, oh, you know what? What did I have? That What did I think of that I need to go back to? That's what yeah. I do. Yeah. And, that and sometimes you just cross things focus. off the list. She was like, that was an interesting thought, but that's not yeah. a whole baked idea yet. So yeah, you, you mm-hmm. sometimes have to absolutely yourself, even with that right side of your brain saying, no, no, no. Or I got something better. Or that's just a, was a building block for something else. But yeah, I love that sort of free thinking. Yeah. Um, so, right. but to answer yeah. your question, as yes. far as, you know, the creative side, um, I color, um, I, 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 I color and I am not, um, Again, an artist. I have my sister. Boy, yeah. can she? She's an amazing artist. I have a cousin also in Geneva who has beautiful paintings and has been exhibited mm-hmm. all over Europe. But for me, oh, nice. um, I used to be told as a child that oh, you need to stay within the lines, right? And I, I'm not very good at that. But I yeah. love to just be able to get in there and and create new new patterns or just mm-hmm, colors mm-hmm. and and then mix the colors as I'm painting and coloring and it really is a thing that helps me stay present in the moment and I keep um I have a send in out and uh that I it's too cold in the winter to hang out in but then I keep my my coloring books in different places I also journal a lot I think oh, that for yeah. me journaling is a place where I can really dump a lot of the stressors or or doubts or really Really even just kind of like make a list. Sometimes we need to clean out house inside our brain and put it down. And that's something that can help you. And um, writing, writing has been something that has been with me for so long. And it's part of who I am. And it's one of the outlets, my creative outlets. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of people um, kind of discount writing and coloring and things like that. As, because I think they are, people, many people are told at a young age, you're not a, the artist. You know, you are, you better find something else that's going to, you know, sustain you because you're not an artist. But, and I think that's very discouraging because I think the definition of artist is, um, gets muddied a lot. I I remember because I was told that I was the artist and that's (laughs) because I could render things exactly as you would, Uh I could draw very realistically. And that for some reason made me the artist. But what about other kids that were, you know, coloring outside the lines Mm -hmm. and with feeling and emotion. I mean, some might say that they're more of an artist than me, you know, because I, mine was more of a tactical sort of approach. And I have since grown beyond that, but yeah, I, I, it always discourages me to hear when people are told young that they're not an artist, but I'm glad that you are still exercising that part because clearly from your childhood, you were creative, like really creative. Um, and this way that you're kind of, you know, doing it, you know, through innovation in your own business, because I definitely include that as being a creative trait that you can use for, mm-hmm. you know, um, to sustain yourself, but to have these li- other little things that you do just for pure pleasure that are just for you, I think are also so important because it's really, um, excluding that left side. It's like, we're not going to think about this. This is just going to be about here because you, you definitely treat your left side. It's like, I really got to figure out these taxes Uh (laughs) and you can't be creative with that at all. So why can't the other side of your brain have that same treat of just saying, you know, we're going to do this without you. You don't get, you don't get to be involved. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that, you know, here's the thing that if there's any task, whether it be a creative task or a task like managing the, the finances for the business, the one thing that I remind myself, if it's new to me, it's always, I am a beginner. Yes. And, and at times we expect to begin a task already at mastery. And really it right. takes 10,000 hours to mastery. So if I haven't spent 10,000 hours at this task, I will remind myself in the frustrating moments that I'm a beginner. I am learning mm-hmm. to. I am working on doing the thing. I cannot be a master at this. And 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 that really helps to put into context that okay, well I this is I'm going to mess up and I'm going to learn how to do it better after I mess up. And that's the one thing that can help individuals really be able to keep going forward and and build their confidence by the way because this mm-hmm. is the whole premise of confidence. I think that a lot of people believe and the misconception is that confidence is that yeah. feeling we have and we are born with or that you know we we get but confidence is only achieved through the actions that we take daily through the practice of a skill 
because the mm-hmm. more that we work at something and, and, and by the way, that means that you will take the first step to working at something and you are going to not feel confident, but you do it anyway. And that's when yes. you start to create confidence. Yeah. And I am a full believer in embracing your, um, your strengths. You know, if yeah. I am not good at doing taxes, then I can uh-huh. accept that because I know I'm great at something yeah. else. And guess what? I'm going to probably hand this off to somebody who's great at taxes. <laughs> that's right. And, and and that's what makes the world go round. And, and you know, exactly. I had a mentor, I had a mentor tell me, do what you do best and delegate the rest. Yes. And yes. that's, that's the truth of it because we, we set ourselves up to, to fail when we think that we can be the, you know, fill in the blank. If I were to go and play tennis, I love tennis, but I am not Serena Williams. But we set the expectations that we're going to be, or we should be. Right. Uh, Again, because of somebody else's, you know, oh, but you've been praying a long time. Why aren't you better? Or whatever it is. We allow these expectations and stories really keep us down and define us when we really should be defined just by what we want. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Julie, this has been an absolute delight. I have loved this conversation and I am going to start following you. Because I oh, think thank um, you. we can all use this little pep talk, no matter how far we've gotten in our careers, because, you know, it's, we get hit with so much negativity or so much doubt that it's good mm-hmm. to say, you know, to have someone in your corner, even if you're just reading it as a reminder that, you know what? Yeah, I can do this. I can be confident. I yeah. can, you know, because why not me? I mean, that's, I just love that statement yeah. that kind of come up into my feed recently. And I'm like, you know, that's an excellent question. <laughs> you know, it's got to be somebody. Um, Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you so much. This has been so great. I've really appreciated Aww. it. And I will have all of your information everywhere that I post this so people can also get in touch with you or just follow you and, and get their pep talk of the day. So. Um, oh, you're so kind. Catherine, this has been a really fun conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you are welcome. <laughs> Oh, it, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And you, you your, your show is amazing. I love this conversation. I think that uh, we need to have more of these conversations in the world where it's, we realize and, and leverage and understand or how our brains work and really how we can continue to have the creative side of us come into even just the mundane every day that sometimes may not look like a creative task. Uh, I appreciate you saying that because this is my latest wild hair <laughs> so far. I love Fred has not talked me out of yet. So I, I appreciate there are people out there that can understand what I'm trying to, you know, ex- share here. And I really want that message to kind of carry through mm-hmm. um, that, you know, it, it is important to always be creative and innovative and it's not all about steam and testing and things like that. Yeah. So um, there's just so 100%. much, more, so much more. hundred percent. Thank you again. Yeah. Thanks again. And don't forget, go confidently in the direction of your dreams, Catherine.